Okay, it's eight o'clock. There we go. Um, I'm having to keep my Facebook open today because I remember last week there was some. Let me just remind you straight away that um, if you find that um, I can't see your name or photo and it was coming up as Facebook user, you need to click on that link. I think there's more to it than that, but that's what I'm being told. So there is a link there on the post somewhere. Um, just get that out of the way, click on it, maybe log out, log in again, because it'd be nice to see your face and who you are. And then I know who you are as well. Right. So there you go. That done. I've reminded myself. Um, nice to see you all. Welcome back to Let's Talk About at the Sports Therapy Association Open Group. Thanks for joining us. Um, we had a great um, inaugural web chat last week with the fantastic, huge man that is Gary Benson, our founder. And um, that was wicked. And it was really nice feedback. Um, it was really, really nice. I think some really good questions came out and, um, and the response was great. And it's urged me on even more because I wasn't quite sure what the response was going to be like. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. If you do join us live, I do encourage you to. I know in this day and age, no one watches anything live. It's all catch up, isn't it? And recording and stuff. And But if you do join us live, then questions might flow a little bit kind of more naturally um, and you'll be able to network as well. But anyway, so that's the idea. Um, what was I going to say? Right. We haven't had any questions coming in, though, about what you'd like us to talk about. The idea of let's talk about is you guys uh, in the Sports Therapy Association actually send me emails saying, hey, can we talk about this? I want someone to talk about this. I'd like to come on the show and talk about this. Give me some of that. OK, I might say no, but I want to try and open it up as much as I can so that you get what you want to say or see or hear. That's what this 30 minutes, 40 minutes is for. Make sense? Fantastic. So because I haven't received anything, I have got next week sorted out already because I've got to be organized. I'll announce that at the end of the show tonight. Um, but coming weeks, I've got nothing planned. The diary is open. So you let me know what you want to know or if indeed you want to come on and talk about something which you think might be relative and help us get along. Right. So today, Jack Chu. Um, I'm hoping not a lot of you know him. Um, I think he's just finished his Cornetto, which is good. Not you know, he's just had his tea as well. Um, so I'm going to um, bring him up. I'm hoping a few of you don't know him. I'm hoping some of you actually haven't been into the Physio Matters podcast because you think well, it's just for physios. I'm hoping some of you might have felt a little bit intimidated, even though you don't want to kind of say that out loud because you think, well, that's for physios. Um, because that's what we're talking about tonight. Imposter syndrome, something which I think sports therapists in particular suffer from. So that's what's going to be. And we're going to try and keep it punchy. If you have got any comments or questions, um, then obviously chuck them down there. But do hit that link first so we know who you are. Right, I'm bringing up Jack. Here we go. Imagine flashy kind of music in your head now. Probably some mank indie kind of tune as it's Jack. There we go. Hey, mate, how you doing? Hi, mate. Yeah, I got a little countdown there as well. That was nice. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt your tea. Well, this is Belive, mate. This is in Zoom. Yeah, this is how cool is that? Out. I know. Very know like I can bring up your name with my branding. Yeah, I can bring up my name. Uh, I can do all sorts of things. But that's fair yeah, enough. I like the lobby as well. You left some snacks out for me. That's what clear was going on Very about. Very good. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. So thanks for going along, mate. Um, let me just before we talk about you let's just see i'm sure there's a few people we both know in the house but the idea of this is there are some people we don't know so we're just going to say hello to see facebook user linda zigmundova great name um if you maybe you have tried clicking that link but in theory if you click that link the belive permission and then go and come back again we'll be able to see your photo rather than putting this up which is like just something blank which is always sad i'm sure you got more personality than that linda so try to click the link um gary's in here looking forward to this jack is a knowledgeable chap it's jack chu not jack march just you know gary right fake, get... fake news. Yeah, he's gonna put... he's, he's, that's, all, that's not don't just... get confused with the jacks um we've got another facebook user says looking forward to it but i don't know who you are sorry um who else we've got emma we've got a lovely photo from emma let's bring that up there we go emma victoria wardle um hi guys so we can see your face it's fantastic there you go. You're networking. Uh, Facebook user says hello. No, that is Mark Nussie. Thanks for coming back two times in a row. That's doing something right for you back in the house. Helen Stone. Hello. How you doing? Uh, Seamus. Do you want to try pronouncing that name, Jack? I know you're quite fond of pronouncing the older Irish names. Do you want to try? Well, and... I mean, I, uh, still got Helen Stone. I can pronounce Helen Stone. I, 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 that I, one. I, that How one. would you say that first name? That's got to be Seamus McWalter. 
not granny or grognier or do you don't want to yeah i know i struggled with that didn't i yeah thank you man <laughs> she hasn't yeah. told you what i called her on my live video yet but that's good <laughs> she says she was going to hang me out to dry i deserve it as well cool <laughs> right so people uh, there's a few people in the house fantastic and matthew scarbrook here as well fantastic thank you for joining these people uh, make sure you do leave some comments and questions remember this is all for you but for now jack introduce yourself I'm Jack Chu. I'm a physio by training and uh, trained at Nottingham University. I've just seen in the comment section, someone said they heard me do, give a talk in Nottingham a few years back. Hi, Talita. I'm um, sorry that I'll once again probably disappoint you, no doubt, like I did then. Um, but uh, welcome, welcome back and uh, thanks for tuning in if you've heard me before. I speak a lot on the internet, basically, about MSK issues. I run a podcast called the Physio Matters Podcast and, and started that when, when podcasts were cool which was a brief period in 2013-14. Uh, um, Ricky Gervais had just been uh, doing a lot of work there. You had to set up your own RSS feed. It was a bit of a faff, and so it seemed like a bit of a tech thing to do. And I did so to try and elicit information from interesting people in the MSK space and put that on the internet as a conversation, in part because at the time I couldn't afford any CPD. I wanted to pick the brains of some of the smartest people in the game and thought that potentially a, a, an analysis that kind of came through the middle between not being sycophantic and happy clappy and just saying about everything being wonderful and, 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 and grand and the ex suggesting that bad practice didn't exist, but then also I didn't want to be one of these nitpicking skeptics that sort of had nothing to say or nothing to offer in its place when critiquing a, a, a problem. And so that's what we tried to do is come through the middle and did a talk show uh, as a podcast. Um, clinically, I've always been into MSK and have my own practice in South Manchester, um, which has a, it's very rehab centric. We have a gym in which I'd say all, all patients are treated in really, apart from the privacy of assessment in clinic rooms, but we kind of get people doing functional scaled training, which is our model of care predominantly. And um, I also am the director of a think tank, which is called Musculoskeletal Reform, MSK Reform. Um, and that is a activist wing essentially of the physio matters Net podcast network uh, what what was born out of it was that people wanted to sort of promote positive health policy in the direction of msk uh, therapies and therefore we set that up and that has members across the spectrum of various different disciplines but it's also got patients and carers and interested business personnel basically anyone can become a member that is interested in promoting quality msk we have a manifesto for reform which is a long document detailing across various different areas as to what we would suggest is positive positive policy uh, for, for making things happen in MSK because I really care about all things from clinical to business to, to policy and so it brings that all together across the various different hats that I wear across my week. Brilliant. And you like to talk, don't you? Yeah, sorry, was that a brief intro? Oh my God, is that it? Are we doing? Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, people. Uh, next week on <laughs> Let's Talk about no, no, brilliant. Um, but there is so much to say about you. And you were um, one of the inaugural. I mean, you came in at a great time. I just want to say to, to narrow that down in a recommendation, I believe that if you, anyone out there wants to become a better sports therapist, then just go through and watch. What number are you on now for TF, for the Physio Matters podcast? What's the latest one? What number? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's 78. Okay, so go and watch 78 episodes or listen to 78 <laughs> episodes of the Physio Matters Easy. podcast. Um, I, I'm hoping some people have, geez, uh, if you haven't heard any of them, and I'm not just saying this because Jack is here, but it's just fantastic. I mean, go and start from the beginning with number one, which was Lee Harrington, I think, um, and then work your way through them. And yeah, it'll make you a better therapist, basically. And also what we're talking about tonight, I think you'll realize that a lot of the things that people talk about, whether it's um, injury specific or different kind of areas of healthcare, it'll, it'll make you realize that you are, as a sports therapist, part of the healthcare provision family, and you do have a place to fit in, which is what we're talking about tonight. So yeah, go and check them out. Um, have you had many sports therapists on the Physio Matters podcast? Five. Five, fantastic. Who was your first one? I don't know. He's not memorable. <laughs> <laughs> it was you, my darling, and you were wonderful. There you go. See, so yeah. they do have sports therapists as well. And since I kind of opened that crowbar to open and allow other people in, <laughs> they, there has been other disciplines. Yeah, it opened up the floodgates. And I think they've been holding had, you all back for so long. Oh, they had chiropractors you? in, osteopaths. They had Reiki practitioners. I've had everybody in there now doing their um, yeah. stuff. But anyway, so now I think relative, I don't know whether it's relative or not, but the other big thing which is more current now is therapy live okay which yeah. i wanted to mention about as well it, 
I think it's interesting. Maybe it's just me making my own thing up, but I think it's interesting that you've come from the Physio Matters podcast to Therapy Live. Why is it not called Physio Live? What's changed? Yeah, I think this, it's a really good point. I think that Physio Matters has had, it's been uh, at least annually, we have, we have debated a name change since we had a team, which was very quickly, um, because it hasn't necessarily represented our views very well. Physio is an interesting word in that it has a real cultural relevance, and that is something that is kind of sticky, and it's a challenge to the other MSK professions. And we'll probably come to why I want to blur the lines and, and why your question's framed as it is and why I talk in therapies and talk in MSK and MSK reform rather than physio reform um, is relevant. But the reason it carries on, the reason it will carry on, we've had another consultation recently as to whether to go for, for therapy matters or something like that, is that there is a, there is a relevance to physio in, in a cultural space and, and and there is actually then some good reason for other msk professions to attach to that cultural phenomenon so we don't have to start from scratch but also there is a hard for academic credibility that's attached to physio where they've been subordinated under medicine and nursing in a political space but particularly under medicine in an academic space that then is a, a really useful tool in other areas of practice um, and a word that is important. And so we do accept that it can sometimes be seen as being too exclusive in terminology. However, um, I think that in, in brief, which I'm not good at, as you know, we are sticking with it mainly because it's got some positive connotations to it as well. And on the balance, it seems positive. Now, Therapy Live is just in keeping with what we, when we, when we start in something now, you'd be very surprised if we found ourselves, even by language, being exclusionary. Whereas in 2013, when I'm putting that together, that probably was more associated to my identity. It wasn't only three years qualified, for example. And and the associations that I had to what was the best and brightest in the game at that point was quite narrow because I hadn't opened my mind and opened my world to understanding who was out there and what was going on. And so that's why that, that word was used. And so to change that off its, off its reputation and its branding would be a big, big challenge and test for us without massive obvious gain. Whereas to start something from scratch, of which we did a few months ago, Therapy Live is, is in keeping with what, what is my broader philosophy, which is that these uh, I do not give a monkey's what flavor of certificate is on your wall. There are good and bad therapists. I'm very much of that flavor and persuasion. And a lot of my work, especially through MSK reform, is directed in that direction. And therefore, uh, that's why that's inclusive and why in, in any recent times you won't necessarily me associating that strongly with physio as an identity yeah yes it is quite amazing how things have changed in the last seven years i think and 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 forwards uh, a positive evolution so again it sounds like i'm just kind of bigging up jack but everything i'm talking about at the moment is free <laughs> the physio matter podcast is free you can you can become a patron if you want and if you really like it and you want to kind of help along with it and that's great but it's there 78 episodes or whatever as is therapy live which is free and i'm hoping again that a lot of you haven't seen it one thing i'm always going on about at social media is like i see it everywhere but then i'm following those feeds and it's like i see my own adverts everywhere for one chat live and stuff <laughs> but not everyone sees it. I'm hoping that people out there haven't come across this. Let's just bring up. It's not the flashes of picture. It's just a screenshot of the. Uh, it really doesn't do it any justice. At yeah, all. you're right. You, you've <laughs> showed it short there, haven't you, mate? What about if I made you it? Hold on. It's, it's quite a nice logo, and you've managed to. There you go. You could have there just done the logo, but um, yeah, therapy. Therapy Live is a massive free MSK summit of nine rooms of education, nine streams of education, ninety plus speakers visiting all sorts of different topics and it is everywhere i mean i think be disappointed if you've not if you've not heard about it and you are in any any corner of, of social media attached to msk i'd be disappointed if that hasn't been shared we've, we've had a great response Thirteen thousand delegates signed up over a thousand i checked and it's over a thousand sports therapists because we are asking as to what your persuasion is and i was going to ask that that's thousand, interesting that's cool over yeah. a thousand of, of them so so yeah um that's that's really the big thing was we were trying to create a bit of a green cpd show basically beginning of this year we're creating the infrastructure to do that we're going to sell tickets into a uh, an education piece because we've got an incredible network through physio matters of a variety of different professionals and um no oh, thanks for that that gary that's brilliant news um what I wanted to do was then, when it all kicked off and we realized that all the face-to-face -face shows were going to be canceled, including some that we were participating in and contributing speakers to, 
um, we realized that there were going to be so many things that were cancelled. We brought forward our plans to create the virtual show, virtual summit, but then also tried to then see at a time that it didn't feel right to be sort of trying to show for tickets. Everything was sort of chaotic. So we tried, we made it free and see if we could fund it by industry because there's certain tech apps and things like that that were also relying on the showtime and the expos, you know, things like Elevate and Therapy Expo and things like that. They were hoping to rely on getting their products out there and, and helping to share what they've been doing, especially on a health tech side where they've got quality software that might help you in this uh, new virtual world. So we then thought if we could try and fund it that way, we could get it free at the point of use again, and which is obviously suits our ethos generally. So it was really good to be able to bring that together. We're less than a month away from that. It's the biggest thing we've ever done, and that's uh, certainly tasked. Uh, it's quite taxing, but it's been it's been huge excitement, and and it's also just been humbling for me to realise just how far we've come with the network of incredible therapists across many disciplines that we have, and also that people will trust us to be credible. Yeah. So once again sports therapists out there talking to you sports therapy association second way to become a better sports therapist um is yeah check this out and again it's not like i'm selling it because it's free um yeah. so how many speakers you got 70 80 they keep multiplying 90 plus it's now. Now. It's it's now so yeah it's, it's 74 sessions and it's yeah. 95 Incredible. speakers yeah okay so you can pick and choose you haven't got to go to kind of like 2 15 friday afternoon for the exercise rehabilitation center and see me you could choose someone else okay don't come and flock to me that'd be ridiculous no there's a huge selection there depending on areas which probably i teach sports therapy and i know there's areas there which aren't taught definitely on level four potentially on some level fives because the syllabus for level fives are just created by ever selling them that's the problem with no regulation in the uk you don't know what you're going to get with sports therapy but um i know masters it's taught quite a lot but there's going to be bits and bobs there which you probably haven't had access to before and it's free and it'll give you a lovely taster and then if you do enjoy certain speakers and they because i mean i've had that i've the day I met Paul Ingram or or um, Todd Hargrove or Greg Lehman or when I found that, that was just an avenue of blogs, which just was like encyclopedias for me to slap them all up. So hopefully with a selection of speakers there, you'll find someone who'll have the same effect on you um, and will open up your career as well. Um, yes, yeah, so you just go register that website. Boom, done. Let's not big that up anymore because it'd be impossible. Anyway, it's going to be huge and fantastic. When is it? June the 26th. June, Friday, June the 26th. Yeah, therapy-live.co.uk. Okay. Okay, right. Now, why have I started this going on about Physiomatics Podcast and Therapy Live? It's all to do with today's subject, which is imposter syndrome. Um, I'm not I know heavily myself, I still even get it. Maybe I'm just even after 10, 15 years, I think every time you see a patient or a client where you think they're not fitting into what I've learned, even after this time. So I imagine what it's like back in the beginning when you've just qualified and you're looking at someone's anterior or posterior iliac crest and measuring it out and you're thinking oh that's what i did on the course and oh, i can't find it oh my god where's it gone oh my god i need to send them to a physio and that's that's why i put the question out there when do you refer people to physios what do sports therapists feel uh, is a red flag where it's like oh my god i've got to send it to a physio or an osteo or a chiro so i put that question out then a few people replied but you're welcome in the in the in the um room tonight if there is a certain case and it might be there are some cases where you should be referring out to physios um which is important as well. But first question I want to ask is, is it just something for sports therapists is imposter syndrome, feeling that you're a fraud and you haven't got enough tools to help? Or is it something that you've gone through yourself as a physio, Jack? Is it something you suffered from? Yeah, there's two, there's, there's, um, there's two answers. I, I, I nearly, I nearly uh, admitted that usually there's more than two in there for, for me, different angles. But in this instance, one thing that's worth mentioning is that when I started to speak my mind and, and, and conduct interviews and, and ask questions, and also I was doing a lot of second opinion work, especially around the time that Physio Matters was doing it, I was trying to have, the, I really cared about clinical education. And so I was going in and, and, and basically trying to firefight complex cases in sports clubs. Um, and so sports therapists, physios, sports rehabilitators, osteopaths that were working as a one-man band, one-woman band in a sports team, amateur sports team, or say semi-pro sports team, I'd go in and try and solve that and try and liaise with the coaches and the players and the, and, the, and, and, and offer that second opinion, usually as, as, a, as a, a consultant that had been requested by the therapists themselves that had heard us on the podcast etc or, or just heard about our services locally and the reason i'm mentioning that is because i'm, I'm doing that at and at about three three and a half years qualified initially 
And so I was constantly being exposed to my own sense of imposter syndrome as to who am I to do this, when really what I was doing was just always just offering my best take on the matter. And there were times where I just needed to be comfortable to say, everything is actually going with it. The plan is, is fantastic here. You know, these are, these are these, going in as an ally of the therapist, not necessarily as a senior of the therapist and certainly not senior in years or senior in experience at that point. It was just more that just a, an overseer and evaluator of the circumstance and being able to just have the back of the therapist to say that the coach has got unreasonable expectations or the player's not fully comprehended it or to be that extra person to say, no, this doesn't, or yes, this does need a scan. So that, that was one thing that I really needed to just sort of suck it up a little bit and understand that my, I was feeding it, it was a very different style of practice and it was a different niche. And so I just needed to lean into my skill set and realize that this is a different style. I'm, I'm coming at this as an educator, as a, as a coach, as, as someone that uh, uh, backed myself in communication skill to try and talk to four different parties and bring this together almost as a problem solving case. And that the fact that I might not have been a physio for as long as the physio that have actually requested me in or whatever it might be, it just didn't didn't start to matter when I realized that actually the je ne sais quoi under what I was doing was something that was unique to me. And everyone will have that piece, really. Everyone will have that own, their own thing that's really tethered to their identity that makes them them and makes them unique and their patients know them to be unique and why they like them. So that, that's one of the things I think that people need to make sure that they recognize is that, that, that you, you shouldn't feel like an imposter when you come to realize that no one else can be you. No one else brings the life experience you bring. No one else has seen the patients you've seen. No one else has had the various different things that have made the mosaic that is you as an individual and if you approach patients in a similar way where you recognize charitably the incredible diversity of, of life that they've had and the circumstances that brings them to you then that interaction becomes really humble and, and, and I think that that's something that really helped me with the first thing I was going to say about imposter syndrome about my youth especially at that time I used to say one of the most challenging I used to sit in job interviews and make this point uh, where appropriate and said one of the, the best and worst things about my CV was my at birth it was the worst thing because it really showed the fact that I just hadn't a lot of the experience in the game but it was the best thing because I felt like I was able to demonstrate what I'd achieved in a relatively short space of time and, uh, and I still continue to use that line a little bit today I've tried to grow a beard like yours but it's sort of struggling but I'm still fairly youthful in the in the game and, and sometimes do struggle with that the second thing is that physios end up in a situation where we are constantly subordinated under medics it's a classic. And it's also completely, and this, weirdly, that stereotype is actually really legit in many cases. Physios and pharmacists sometimes are failed doctors. They, just, they didn't get the A grades at school or whatever, and they weren't necessarily um, academically scientific, and therefore, therefore they did end up just falling back on physio or it was manual medicine or whatever. So th that, that does carry, and therefore there's something that, that does mean that some of us do end up with a chip on our shoulder, uh, trying to scrap and, and, and feel like imposters to the fact that we've got to justify ourselves to, to the doctors. Um, and, and it's an interesting thing that we've all experienced. And also there's certain pressures, especially when you're picking, picking up some of the, uh, the, the medical angle to it, and especially when you're doing some medical triage in certain roles, you then start to feel obliged or even pushed or encouraged by medical mentors to try and go into medicine and just say, look, you, should, you know, I, I'd, have a I'd have a job for you in my... Uh, I'd have a job for you in my orthopedic surgery. If I could give you a scalpel, I would do, and things like that. And they sort of try and bait you, be that by salary or, or by guidance, to try and bait you into a medical profession. And so we do end up with a bit of that. So you need to recognize that because of that environment, um, that imposter syndrome can exist as well, where you've got physiotherapy and physiotherapists as a profession uh, and everything else around that area is always going to be in the shadow of medicine to some extent politically. You think about it that way. And physios have this funny chip on the shoulder. The CSP, the Chartered Society of Physio, it's hilarious, really. They, they, they've got this, it's like a hobby of theirs. It's a bit, I, I find it embarrassing personally as a member. I try and discourage them to do it. But it's basically like tweets where some politician will say, we need more doctors and nurses, and they'll go, and physios or and allied health professionals. It's just cringe for me, but it's just that those talking points, being left out of those talking points, does sometimes feel really relevant. And so I think every every stage of these things ends up having, everyone's got a bit of an angle of imposter syndrome. I've certainly had it both personally and my professional uh, identity as a physio, we, we all have it a bit. Um, and, and I think as well, my answer to the first point is to the second one as well, is that, that, that realistically, we're kind of coming to realize that the evidence should be our guide. And that's one of the big unifiers. And we talked a little bit about this last night on the Therapy Live newscast, uh, is that if the evidence is our guide, we end up with more similarities than differences. And then, 
on top of that, if you recognize your own individual capabilities and skill set, then no one can be like you. And, and therefore, who are you imposing? It's a good answer. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I put this out, this uh, topic tonight, thinking that I don't think I've softened up this group yet, Sports Therapy Association, because I was expecting to people come out and go, oh, yeah, I went to this stage with a few patients where I really thought I'm going to, I don't know anything, I'm going to become a physiotherapist or I'm going to become an osteopath. I was thinking people are going to open up because I'm sure people do feel that. However, at the moment, it seems to have gone the other way at the comments I'm reading and stuff I've heard before, where it seems to be a little bit more like sports therapists are feeling a bit of hostility towards physios because there is that experience. I think the common one is often pitch side, for example. How many times are sports therapists threatened or told, you can't call yourself a physio, take that T-shirt off. You're not a physio, you're just a sports therapist. When often that, you know, because it is a protected title, and I understand the logic in that, but I think that creates a barrier now and again, because often that person on pitch side will then open up the newspaper and they'll read a column written by a physio and it's talking about stick a bit of string around your waist and pull your belly button, belly button in, you know, and that's from a physio in, in a, in a media. I'm sure you know the article and don't need to say the name of the physiotherapist, but sports therapists who are clued out realize that there's some pretty crap physios or oh, crap's a bit strong. Let's not say that. And crap's uninformed. No, <laughs> it's down South, mate. Don't forget. With you don't need to be, you don't need to be gentle with that. No, there's some terrible information that gets put out there by physios. And yet physios seem to, be protect, protected inside this because it is registered and they've got the name and no one else can use it i think i'm seeing i mean there was an interesting question here which is kind of maybe to get rid of all my questions on here there was something put by through mark mccool um gary's just brought it up i won't show the whole question on here but i'll just bring it up to show oh gary's actually telling it but um it's be interesting to flip that question um and ask professions the same question in regards to referring to sports therapists basically to cut it short He's talking about how physios often just see sports therapists, massage therapists. They never really give them any, quote, juicy client rehab, unquote. So um, there's never been that respect. Um, and maybe that's, I mean, maybe that is, maybe that's why some sports therapists haven't actually been. Know it all physios who just think our professions are just body rubbers. So I guess my question to you would be, yeah, before I get on to Talita. Um, do physios look down on sports therapists in general? Why do you think that is? Or is it just a bit of a myth that's kind of perpetuated by a few physios? What, what's the deal there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to... These questions that are coming in and the comments are absolutely brilliant. And I'm so easily distracted that I'm going to need to just close them off myself. And if we don't get to them, if me and Matt don't get to them, I just want you all to know that, that I will answer them individually, whether it be that privately or, or, or publicly on Facebook or Twitter if you need to. So let's make sure that none of those stones go unturned because there's absolutely brilliant comments and I, I really do value them, but I just am that bad at being distracted. Um, so there's a lot there. The first thing I want to mention... Is the protected title piece that, that, you, that you're bringing up there is, is really relevant. It's, it's important to understand, especially through my work with MSKR, understanding the context of, of how these things emerge and why, why is there a chartered society, for example, of which you then join as a means of joining a trade union with no barrier to entry barring your actual graduate degree. And therefore, it's chartered, whereas chartered accountants and surveyors and things like that, it's, it's inferred that there is a level of postgraduate education that's then a quality standard that might stop cowboys like you're describing in the media being able to be, there's no credibility to it, right? So to understand that and all the things I've just described, we did it through a massive project and wrote a manifesto critiquing it, essentially. So. We need to be careful with regards to flippancy or the thinking that these things should be torn down because they might have a poor utility to them. So there are occasions where the protected title of physiotherapy can really be exclusionary to others and therefore be a beating stick for people that want to use the... Um, the thing that I mentioned before about what society understand physio to be, and therefore sometimes it makes sense for a sports rehab, a sports therapist, an osteopath that are working in what might be classically considered a physio role, classically like bucket and sponge man on the side of the pitch, what have you, is, is what people perceive. They might want to use and lean into that public perception of physio and therefore be beat over the head by someone who does rightly say it's a protected title. Now, the, the 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 way through the the middle of that is to have understanding over the fact that the 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 roles need to be blurred appropriately uh, but also to understand that that physio 
protection, the, the, the protection over that title has a historic relevance that is to avoid some of the things, and this is why, I, I forgive my way of being controversial, because there's a whole host I understand of, of politics under it, but it's it's one of the reasons as to why in, we need to try to understand that the, the language of physiotherapy is something that is going to be unified compared to something like sports therapy, which has so many different tiers to entry for graduate and non-graduate profession. So that is messy in itself, and I know it's fraught with other issues, and I'm not going to go there in full, but I'm just meaning that you understand, please do understand that there are so there is some utility for some of the walled garden that's existed historically, and there's a reason for that, to make it distinct from medics, to professionalise massage therapy historically, to desexualize massage therapy originally, to move into remedial gymnastics and then realise they actually needed to be a bit of both, hands and exercise. So the, the history and the legacy of, of physiotherapy and of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy is certainly relevant to understand if you wanted to. Now, you don't have to, trust me, it's boring, but be careful careful if like i've done before you make the mistake of thinking that it's all nonsense and actually it's just protectionism and tribalism it's just physios trying to leave people out it's not that it is for some but historically it's relevant and actually if we get it right then the legacy of what physio has gone through and the way it stopped itself being subordinated by medicine we need a drag effect on that because if we just burn that to the ground because it feels unfair generally then we're going to miss out on an opportunity to try and carry things a bit faster. Whereas I would say we need to try and share those spoils better. Totally agree. And I don't like the exclusionary nature of many in my profession. Or even many some, people might accuse me of similar things. I'd love to hear that argument. But it's just that I do, I do hear a sense of, not always, but it's, there is a bit of bitterness, a bit of resentment. I'm not sure there's some that deserve it, but does the profession as a whole deserve it? Um, if you are, if you want to make claims against organisations because of what they have in their in their policy, be specific, or how you've been made to feel by X, Y, Z, be that the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, the Healthcare Professions Council, who might have uh, inferred certain things over the years, be specific. But painting with a broad brush and to lump me into something like that, not because I'm being sensitive about it, but just as someone that you'd probably find that you you won't have me disagree on your with a, with you on a point by point basis. But if you paint with too broad a brush and infer that of physiotherapy generally, or physios think this of me, physio think this of sports therapists, then you're going to end up. Um, you're going to ruin your relationship with some quality allies, I would say. And I don't mean me as a quality ally. I'm, I'm no one, really. But I have access to a decent network of thinkers that, that could probably do you some favours. And, and that would be a shame if you were to just associate me um, with, with, with this generic caricature of physio, which I just don't think is accurate in today's world. Yeah. It's, no, it is important. What you said is, I think I wonder whether – I mean, I was lucky and very blessed to – kind of fall into a multidisciplinary team. And I think that's molded me into what I am because I went through two things. I had the first thing where I felt imposter syndrome, I would refer to the physio and sometimes the osteopath and, and externally. Oh no, we had podiatrists as well. So I could get rid of people who were kind of making me feel a bit, oh, I can't deal with that. But then I also had the benefit of, well, in some cases having that physio then talk to me and say, no, you were perfectly right. It's great. What you did was perfect. Your notes were great. There was nothing else to see. You don't have to. I mean, my physio grew tired of me referring people to him. He's like, dude, leave me alone. I mean, I don't need <laughs> these people, please, you know, which was building. But then I also had the benefit later on with a bit more experience of, of the physio doing things, which I was like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Looking at the notes after and going, yeah. well, they didn't even check that. So with that, you get to see that, the other, it's like the grass is green. You always think that you send to a physio and they're going to do something incredible. And then later on with your career, you start getting patients coming in. This is particularly for younger sports therapists. You will, a lot of your career and your income will come from people who have come from physios. And okay, it is their way of describing what they've done. And it's a bit kind of, you know, you can't believe everything the patient says, but you will have cases where someone will come in with Achilles tendinopathy and they went to the physio and the physio just gave them a stretching exercise, drop your heels over the edge of here. And you'll have that experience to know, geez, hold on. It's, it's, it's an insertion or Achilles problem. And yet you're trying to stretch the hell out of it. And that's what the physio said. And you have to be careful because maybe it was mistranslated, but there will be cases where as a sports therapist, you will be able to help someone who wasn't helped by a physio, Absolutely. especially if they come from the NHS and the 15 minute kind of thing, which is another big thing, which no, is issues. But 
It's a great. It, it, these are all great points. I want to make sure I don't seem to have skirted off the question about the referral piece. So I, I will answer that. But on your on your point there about the the, the way in which self reflection plays a part in all of this is that we've all been in this situation where there is some level of arrogance that does seem to come down a chain sometimes, chain of command of classic sort of what uh, reputationally are seen as being tiered professions or what have you. But also just on a clinician by clinician basis, you can have me reading the notes of an arrogant surgeon that hasn't checked something or the sports therapist reading the arrogant notes of my arrogant notes of a physio that's then not checked something as a means of complacency. And it's basically just every clinician down the line might not have been self-reflective or thoughtful or critical with the evidence or understanding it or keeping up to date. And so if there is, you know, I just don't, I don't know, but I've, I've, I've met there's, there's good and bad physios and there's good and bad sports therapists. And I'm, I'm excited to be presented with the evidence potentially by the STA for the fact that actually, actually their, their, their members are completely spotless. And that if I was to encounter the notes of all of them, uh, certainly not on this stream, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, if, it, if, it, if they've got a, a mechanism for cr retaining credibility at such a level, then we want to hear about it and we want to translate it. But as a general rule, I think it's happening across the way. It's just that it comes with this sort of sense of loftiness that sometimes comes from physios which like we look on at sometimes seeing surgeons and that's sometimes why that that tarring with a broad brush kind of happens i don't necessarily think of a way in which i would want it, I, i'd be embarrassed if i was local enough to you matt i would be embarrassed to be referred patients from you i cannot comprehend it i can comprehend me referring a runner that a few sessions in i'm not making much ground with because you, you see more runners and specialize highly you're one of the people that's taught me the most about managing running injury but and similarly where i might feel comfortable is in a specific case where you've seen a few patients and then it's because i've ended up working in sort of extended scope triage something more medical like it's some weird some weird he's describing what sounds like a blood pressure type thing might there be something niche vascular going on there where maybe my background lends me to having that big big picture overview of his medical workup but i'm talking niche there i can think of far more cases i've referred to you however i couldn't give a monkeys that you're a sports therapist that's not me thinking about a recognizing a context in which i would refer to a sports therapist that's me thinking of a context in which i'd refer to you my friend matt phillips who happens to be a sports therapist i couldn't give a monkeys as to the flavor of certificate on your wall i'm just describing my relationship with you and therefore i can't think if there's a if there's a sports therapist that's that's encountering a case and then they're on google trying to work out which physio to maybe recommend generically that I think is poor logic. A specific therapist of a certain persuasion, totally reasonable. But I think that's where mistakes would be made. And I think that is imposter syndrome in its fullest. If you were making an association for you struggling with a case and thinking that it is because of your professional persuasion in MSK and therefore making a broad assumption about the, 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 the clinical competence of another profession, especially my own that has no credibility in actually managing what a therapist does. I mean, you had Gary then saying he's going to accredit the CPD of, of, uh, of Therapy Live. Absolutely fantastic. There's absolutely no such thing as accredited CPD in physiotherapy. The ACPC does this paper exercise every few years. It's absolute garbage. STA, SST, BASRAT, three that definitely have a better credibility than physios, for example, on maintaining professional development. So you've got a 10 year qualified physio, they could be good or bad. And so I would say that it's on an individual basis uh, or on a, on a small group basis, I would say, or, or knowing that a quality, there's a quality physio practice or a chain of practices that have got some sort of mechanism of credibility for reputation. But actually on a broad professional level, I can't, I can't actually think of examples. And, and, and personally, I would feel uncomfortable to generically receive a, a referral from a, a sports therapist, especially one that's sort of uh, in touch with the evidence and, and, and has a sensible contemporary model of care where the, they, they've got a good grip of what mechanisms of effect we're working under and things like that, then I would want a really specific referral for me to understand so that I could follow on from their care or offer a second opinion rather than it just being generically, uh, I would have to make some guesses as to what they did and they're making guesses as to what I would do. And I think that that's where mistakes would be made. It's good. I think that's, I think everyone's kind of guilty. I mean, sports therapists, I think you have to, you're not going to get anywhere if you start 
feeling hostile towards physiotherapists. The only reason why I think I can stand my ground now is because I have mixed with other professions and I have had that benefit of both learning from physios, osteos, chiropractors, but because every little profession has got something going on there. Others wouldn't have managed to exist for this long. But so it is all about mixing. It's about meeting people and forgetting about their profession. And that's what I think is so good about the therapy live which is going to happen about although it's called the physio matters podcast as soon as you get into it you'll see that there's a lot of blowing even from the very beginning and i'm not and just trying to get rid of this imposter syndrome kind of belief it's having confidence in yourself and what you do there's some fantastic comments coming through here i mean it's really gone through the roof tonight it must be the mank accent or something I always sound more polite kind of it's a bit like rom seal isn't it it's kind of it just feels more believable when you got that northern accent up north but um yeah there's so many here. And it, it matters by the way i think it's worth mentioning that it's not msk centric so you've got respiratory and neurophysios that have always suggested that our name is too generic um and and that's a that's something we've had to deal with and so you know we we, we get it from all sorts of different sides that really msk matters something that might be might be more worthwhile uh, but but you know i do i do sort of half apologize and half not for the for the name thing oh jesus now you're a, you're a pioneer in releasing free information you are the ricky gervais of the world of therapy so <laughs> you can't turn around i bet he ricky gervais wishes he hadn't said a few things back in the day i don't apologize and i think it's a good testimony i that's why i've got that timeline of physiomats podcast and therapy live i think it's a fantastic sure it is a journey a lot that's happened and that's why i want everyone in here to benefit from that journey and see the changes just because we are way past 30 minutes already who was i going to fall i just want to have a little look based on what we've been talking about um talita buckers let's just bring that up um, as a physio, I definitely have felt as a physio. Oh, good. Salute to the physio. I misread that. As a, oh, don't need sort of she's got to say. Any sports therapists out there? <laughs> <laughs> as a physio, I definitely have felt and occasionally still feel as an imposter after 26 years. No way. When did you start when you were six? Anyway, and do refer to people. Um, where is it? Oh, it's disappeared. Was this the comment? Talita, Talita, Talita. Um, and do refer to people with more different knowledge and experience, no matter who, what their job title is. Well, there you go. There's um, somebody who's been a physio for a long time. Yeah, and, and she's the one that said that she'd heard a talk of man before and was still here. So, yeah, she's become a, a favourite viewer. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Here's the other comment about it was Jack who talked most and not you, but... She's most rubbish. <laughs> uh, we've got... We've got um, just get rid of that. So I want to make sure you people have a chance to voice your questions. Um Anna Maria had some great comments, which I'm not going to put up because it wasn't really on this thread, but um, look through the comments, people. Anna Maria is someone I've got loads of time for. And Matthew Scarsbrook comments as well, some great stuff. I'm just scooting through those because there was some stuff we were talking about. Facebook users, I'm not sure who this is because I don't know if you click the link. That's reassuring. I often feel imposter syndrome compared to other therapists I meet. If I feel out of my depth, I refer to other relevant professionals. So whoever that is, I don't know if anyone can see their name. I wonder how long you have been treating, or I don't even like that word, how long you've been in the profession for. Um, it'd be interesting to see if that comes out of lack of experience or confidence. Or, you know. I think one of, the, one of the things that's probably, I mean, I've just, I've just uh, dared to, to open up the chat function again because I'm allowing myself to be distracted by it. That's what you're doing. But it's, the, what is the mechanism for overcoming imposter syndrome? And, and, and for me, it was like, Obviously, I'm always this conversation. I'm always the pro conversation guy. Like, let's talk it out. Let's work out where the overlap is. And if there is a distinction and a disagreement, let's work out where it is. Let's sharpen it up. Let's narrow it if it's narrow, but then feel free to talk, you know, hash it out. And, and generally speaking, if you encounter someone, so you're feeling like you might be generally subordinating your, your knowledge underneath someone and you engage them in a conversation about why do you think like that? What about what I've done? Do you mind if I share my work or whatever? And they end up then adding to your imposter syndrome, not by their brilliance, but by just a loftiness or a sense of, of arrogance, especially if they're doing that under a professional badge, um, especially when you can just take from me that there's just no there there, right? If a physio's doing that, then it's just it just cracks me up that, that what, what on earth have physios got to, to, to be arrogant about, apart from a general legacy in which they get 
job opportunities at an easier rate, right? Which is not justified, by the way, and therefore needs to be needs to be changed. But if they're thinking that their degrees are of some sort of significant caliber, if anything, they, they get watered down, especially in an MSK front. There is a good case to be made that there's a well balanced uh, education across disciplines. But for MSK, it tends to be being a bit thin on the ground. So generally speaking, when you engage someone, just recognize that if they're being that way, they're not worth your time anyway. So if they're making you feel that way, then just sack them off. But but then you also don't want to be delicate about it. If you're wanting to tiptoe into it or you introduce yourself to a physio and then to lock them in, they go into a going into an exchange about CPD or about not sorry about uh, the evidence or a style of practice or whatever it might be. If you engage them and you feel that you want to, as a sports therapist, you're automatically subordinating yourself, or you're expecting them to engage you somewhat charitably and friendly. You're not saying. I'm a first year student, may I have this conversation? Sometimes you're engaging them, engage them as an equal and be treated as an equal. And if they're rude, you sack them off. But if they engage you as an equal and then you feel like, oh, that were a bit rude, you know, they've, they've, they've made assumptions that I might know this or that they can talk to me that way. Then sometimes there is that sensitivity. And I've done that with doctors before, especially surgeons and stuff. It's, there's an abruptness to the way in which they go about things sometimes. And again, I'm, I'm playing into that stereotype a bit, but you engage with an orthopod and you're trying to get your point across and stuff. And sometimes I've gone into them and thinking that exchange didn't go well in part because I came to it trying to as if I was punching above my weight when of course I'm not it's just I know what I know they know what they know so it was actually a, in part my fault that it didn't go well so make sure you're not delicate and sensitive that's not helpful too but similarly don't be pushed around because that's just ignorant people never mind their profession I think that's really good advice and I'm yeah I think that's a message to give we're running out of time but yeah I think everyone's kind of said it in the in the comments here I do it's, an argument's normally got a two-way thing. It's not just one person and then someone running away. It's a bit forwards and backwards. So what what you say, Jack, is very true. Be confident that you are a sports therapist and talk. It's, it's all, who would have thought it's all about communication at the end of the day? But being confident in what you do, um, because a lot of what you do is better than what a lot of other people are doing, and it is about people. Gary Benson, obviously, sums it up nicely here. Um, he says, the biggest thing I would like to change is therapists see other local therapists as competition instead of thinking as allies. It's yeah. true, and that can happen between sports therapists, but definitely between professions. It is tricky when you know sports that I don't think I hang around in different groups, you know, and I don't think the people I hang around with do kind of slag off sports therapists because they know too many of them now and, and they've got to talk to them and they've hung out at conferences with them. That That's why I want, you know, obviously – Conferences like One Chat Live, October the 29th and 30th in Brighton. It's a chance for therapists from different dis disciplines to meet up together. And there you might have somebody. I mean, everybody who came last year thought Derek Griffin was going to be a stuck up kind of like, won't talk about anything apart from pain and have no personality whatsoever. And everyone was just so surprised and so gratified that he's a fantastic human being with a wicked sense of humor and just a joy to be around. So how we see each other over Twitter and that is like, you can't do it. So when we are allowed to have conferences again, take advantage of those. Don't just go to sports therapy um, conferences, go to multidisciplinary ones. Um, yeah, we really it's important, isn't it? It's amazing what you can sort out over a cup of tea and a biscuit when you're talking to somebody from a different profession and you realize it's people. Gary's point, Gary's point there is really, it's really tough, isn't it? Because the village in which we've set up a practice in South Manchester, it's a village called Timperley, and it's got seven hairdressers. And I don't, I feel like I really went when they're open again. I think I'm going to have to, I might have more time on my hands as the patients trickle back through the door or what have you, but I'm going to go and have that conversation to try and understand as to how they perceive each other. Because they, one of the reasons why, because I don't think there's something in between what Gary's saying there. Like I would hope for allyship. And I think that's good. But that only really works if you're all not having to fish in the same waters for business. Whereas I think what happens with them is they probably don't know each other or don't work together on stuff where people are actually, they're better at perms than me or whatever. I doubt that's happening. It's just that there's enough of a pool, there's enough people wanting haircuts that it just don't matter so much. So they're not as bothered about each other. So we've got this problem where we do have a bit of a scarcity mindset where people don't perceive their need for our services. And we've not positioned ourselves sensibly in public health for people to realize that actually we're just brilliant coaches for trying to get overcome injury, to aspire to performance, to functionally, functionally scale yourself from where you are to where you want to get to. Our sales pitch has been terrible across the disciplines. So we're not getting that hunger from that community to service 
a sports therapist, an osteopath, and a physio on the same road. And so inherently we end up needing to compete because we're fishing for the same things. And as soon as that's happening, a sort of tribal cattiness, self-preservation, needing to pay the bills comes in. And, and there is this superiority that, that can happen much like i imagine if you had three accountants on the same row and not a lot of people needing accountancy you know i can just i'm, all, I'm mixing my professions now aren't i but i i think that that, that that we the allyship thing is great but if we can't get there quick enough because because the market doesn't allow it then let's just all be belly laughing at anyone that suggests that one profession has any sort of monopoly on on, on quality because they've just no one's proven it including sports therapy by the way right you know, it's like if, the minute that you guys want to perceive yourselves in, in, you need to present the evidence to me if you want to perceive yourselves as a block as superior to physiotherapy. Like, I, I want to hear that analysis. I want to work that out. As soon as we're going not for equal but better, then you need to be damn specific. Or if you're going to be general, then present me with some data or some decent subjective accounts or even some logic underneath what you're doing. Because I don't buy that at all. The reason I'm speaking as I am is because actually I don't think any claim of superiority, regardless of discipline, carries. And that would play that way as well. So uh, I'd love to be challenged on that, though. <laughs> And there you go. And we'll make sure that Jack's details and address is put out for those of you who want to challenge him on that. It's uh, look, we've run out of time now, I'm afraid. Um, well, I have. I've got dinner on the table. So um, I don't know about you guys. Um, it's supposed to be half an hour of these. Let's talk about nice, short, snappy things. But so many questions in there. And um, obviously, yeah, I mean, I'm going to keep I know Jack's going to keep an eye on that thread in the comments. And maybe we can keep talking afterwards for the next week or so. There's some fantastic comments in there. And it's good. That I hope we have got you thinking. And I hope some of you who have kind of said in the background, yeah, I suffer from imposter syndrome. Maybe there's some impetus there to have more confidence, like Jack says, and realize your worth. And 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 maybe think as well that maybe it's because I am seeing them as the enemy and someone I've got to compete with and they're not should be talking about them and ringing them up and saying, hey, let's have a coffee. Let's talk about what we do and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, um, to wrap well, things comments, up. Comments end up going on to on Facebook as well. So yes, they'll all be on Facebook. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to you. I'll get to you. Definitely. Comments and questions, be that private or public. Uh, definitely want to go through that. It's an important topic. So I'd, I'd love to help but where I can. And, and also, please don't be shy to, to challenge me on any of the points that I've made because there's bound to be some of them that are wrong. But if they're wrong, I'm wrong by accident. I promise. <laughs> right. You can see a lot of more Jack's work. Just going to bring it up once more. Um, therapy Live. Um, still taking is there a cap on this? Are you just letting people sign up until June the uh 26th? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really know, know. God, really. It's 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 starting to scare me. Um, yeah, I can't afford the bandwidth for more than 20,000 people, so because okay. I can't comprehend that, but um, and also it's 10,000 more than 10,000 people can't get onto your webinar, so we're a bit nervous about that. At the moment, we've got 13,000 registrations, nine streams, but we know that there will be a bottleneck on your session. So I'll see what we can do and try and see if we can bump that up uh, to beyond 10,000 people in your webinar. But um, no, do join us. Um, it's it, and, and just rest assured that the platform that we're using, the micro site for what Therapy Live will be hosted on, will look an awful lot better than that graphic screenshot that Matt's just. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm embarrassed <laughs> about that. Go and see the advertising. It's a lot better. Yeah, I'll give it a that. Let's just, just give it a that. That's really embarrassing. It's a last minute thought. I'm sorry about that. I know my kids. I had to put my kids down at seven o'clock, and then it was like. I thought you meant your kids had done that graphic. No, 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 no. <laughs> Mind you, whoever created that website, maybe I don't know. I don't want to put. It. Anyway, right, Jack. Yeah, I've got it's all, right. all right. Anyway, you know, you've got to chuck you out, mate. Um, yeah, mate. Thank you, you so much. Um, if people want to actually, I mean, you're everywhere, aren't you? Where do you hang out most of all? Is it Twitter or Facebook, or where's? No, I don't. I don't really most? use Facebook personally on on my on my account, really, on professional issues. Um, and so Twitter, uh, Jack at Jack A Chew, uh, or at TPM Podcast on Twitter is where you can find most of our stuff. Uh, Therapy Live, particularly on Facebook and Instagram, because we're doing a lot of marketing through that. Um, just just get to, get to Therapy Live, and you'll find everything downstream from it. If you're interested in the policy, or you want to understand more about that, loads of free resources at mskreform.org.uk, in which you can then read through that and to decide if that's for you. Then absolutely, the inclusive think tank to push quality policy, including blurring the lines between disciplines. That's what you want to be joining and getting involved in. 
there we go and i promise you jack will write that address down in the comments at some point just so you can uh, click on that and go that straight away All right jack thanks mate thanks so much for giving up your free time as always no um and uh i will probably I'm, I'm sure we're talking on something last week mike james made a comment saying i'm seeing you two more than my wife this week so yeah i'll probably <laughs> see you tomorrow night somewhere thanks no mate no see you soon no bye bye there we go. What a lovely bloke. Uh, oh, but what a lovely audience as well. So many questions. Thank you for um, so many comments. I really do hope that it's inspired some thought and that this comment feed can continue. Um, it's really cool. I'm really happy. It's exactly what myself and Gary um, wanted to happen, create some dialogue. But um, also, I hope I've given you some food for thought for some quality CPD. That's the idea. Maybe it's all free. We're not making money out of this. It's just to make you a better therapist. And I'm confident that it will do. Right. Anything else I want to tell you about? Just uh, to mention that, yeah, next Tuesday, we're going to have Matthew Scarsbrook, who was in the audience today. I didn't bring his comment up, but it was a valid point. Have a look in the comments. Matthew is going to be talking about, or Matt. I don't like calling him Max. There's only one Matt. On the internet that's me but matthew will be talking about um, online consultations which i still think is a very important topic because i think we're going to have a second peak big time personally i think you really do need to sort out now um how your career is going to continue and you need to get onto the online thing um if you want to yeah be around when it comes back but um, matthew's going to be talking all about that so do join us tuesday next week um, same time, eight o'clock, uh, where Matthew um, will be the guest. And he's a brilliant speaker. Um, I think most of you in here probably know him. If you don't, um, then check him out. Real connection between physical and mental in practice, biopsychosocial works with, um, yes, he's in a multidisciplinary team. So he's got a lot to say about that. But yeah, all about online consultation next week. Um, if you like the sound of my voice as much as me, then do uh, join me this Friday at one o'clock. Well, it's a weird one this Friday for Run Chat Live podcast. Um, a weird one in the sense I'm throwing in a bit of a swerve ball, swerve ball, curve ball, um, because I'm going to interview a, um, a fantastic female vocalist who I have followed for 15 years since her early days um, in the early 2000s with the Love Gods. Um, and then she was also in um, Nouvelle Vague, fantastic bossa nova remixes of 80s tunes in really, really great group. Um, and also um, a producer of her own albums under the Dea and three albums. Um, reason being, I just like chucking in a swerve ball sometimes, but she let out on one of her um, online kind of gigs online on Facebook that she was thinking of running a marathon. Um, but had a few barriers and stuff. And I was like in there, right, but there's a challenge. So basically what's going to happen is I am going to talk to Nadia a little bit about her music, show some videos, my favorite five songs or something. If you do love music, particularly kind of rock, um, well, have a look, look her up, which is plenty of stuff everywhere. She's actually now moving more into electro pop and stuff and has got a new album coming out soon um, with uh, called Nadia and Becky, which is kind of a more, well, they call it Bauhaus pop, but check it out. Um, but I'm going to be talking about that. And then she's going to be firing questions to me about certain barriers she sees to doing a marathon. So it is still run chat live as well. Um, so there will be a mixture there. But it's bound to be a great chat. And she's a fantastic, lovely person. Um, so, yeah, join me Friday at one o'clock for that if you're around, if you're not back at work or doing something. And that'll be one o'clock UK time on my Facebook feed. Um, and that's everything, I think. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. Once again, thank you for Jack. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday for Matthew Scar's book, same time, same place on STA. Let's talk about. Thank you. And we'll see you soon.